Well, good morning, New Life. How are we all doing today? Oh, well, it's good to see you at church. And man, how about that weather? It actually feels like summer um, in Seattle. It's August. Um, want to welcome those who are watching online. We're actually finally getting our summer here in Seattle. Uh, we also have our Maple uh, Valley campus, Normandy Park, all our other campuses watching right now. So we just give it up, New Life, just for everybody who's here today. And uh, man, you picked coming to church. We have Seafair going on this weekend. And uh, on Friday, I was invited by a couple from the church to go watch the Blue Angels. And I had never seen them before. I've been here for, living here over 15 years. And has, has anyone actually seen the Blue Angels before? Okay. Yeah, incredible just uh, what they do. They, like, they look like they're flying so close. And at any moment, they could hit each other. It's just like crazy. But we have just been enjoying uh, this sun. And if you have AC, you're really enjoying it. And if you're not, then you're just spending time in the shade more often. So, but uh, we are right in the middle as a church in the Apostle Paul series. And this has been an incredible series, just really looking at the writings of the Apostle Paul, his theology, and how it practically impacts our everyday life as Christians. And so we've been unpacking 1 Corinthians this summer, and um, 1 Corinthians is just a perfect book, just really for our day and age that we're living in now. You know, uh, Paul the Apostle wrote this book about 20 years after Jesus had ascended. Uh, he'd risen from the dead, and he writes this book to uh, the church, and this is just something that's needed in our day and age, because right now, as we know, we are in such a divided world. And when Paul was writing to the church, here, he was really writing to a church that was also uh, divided in different uh, reasons. And what we're looking at as we unpack the whole book here is that a divided world needs a united church. That's what Paul would say over all the whole writings of church. You've got to be uh, united because an, an undivided world here or a divided world here needs a church that's united underneath the name of Jesus. Every tongue, every tribe, every nation that confesses Jesus is Lord, the world needs needs a united church. And so as we go over the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, we've, we've read about the celebrity pastors having an issue with that. You know, who's better, Paul the Apostle or, or the other guy, uh, Apollos? And, and Paul the Apostle, we learn, he's like, hey, guys, I, I plant the seeds. You know, Apollos, he's awesome too. He waters it. But at the end of the day, God makes it grow. We're all sinners saved by the grace of Jesus. There's no one better person than another that sin has cast us out of relation with God, but because of Jesus, that's what we come under, the authority of God through Christ Jesus, that there is no celebrity pastors. We're all the same in Christ Jesus doing work for the Lord. And then we read about really the sexual immorality that was taking place in this church. And Paul the apostle had to say, hey, your body is a temple of God. It's not just coming to church on a Sunday to confess Jesus is Lord. It's knowing that when we confess that Jesus is Lord, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same spirit that lives inside of us, that our bodies are a temple. How would that change the way we live? Paul would ask that question for us today. And then he really goes over in 1 Corinthians, we went over lawsuits. And you know, being a pastor for over 15 years now, you think, well, Christians are just different. You know, no, there's disputes. <laughs> in the church as well. And as pastors, we come and we guide and we talk through and how we handle uh, dis disagreement in the church has got to be different than how the world handles disagreement. We're children of God, the body of Christ. And then it, we talked about poor conduct that uh, the church uh, was dealing with in that, that time. And so today, we're gonna actually open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and uh, we're really gonna be talking about some dysfunction and disagreements and things that are going on around a table. And so let's pray together. And um, if you're coming in, we're gonna be receiving communion uh, in a moment. And so if you're watching online or you're in uh, one of our campuses, uh, make sure you pick one of those up. Um, as you came in, you should have been gotten that. And if you're online, then man, get some drinks, get uh, some food and, and bring someone with you along this. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that we get to be a part of what you're doing, God, in our lives. That, Lord, you're not, we don't just remember your death, God, but you are alive. And so I pray we'd open up our minds, our hearts to what your word, scripture wants to say to us today. We love you, God. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, I don't know your tradition 
about the times in which you gather around a table. Um, some families, you may gather around a table weekly. Uh, some of us are young adults, and so you're in college right now, and so maybe you have a dorm or you're with some friends. Even this summer, there's moments that you've taken to go outside and, and have a meal with friends that I don't know, you know when you do those things, but every single one of us, maybe it's once a year at holidays where you get around a table with food. For me, it was every Sunday. Growing up in Moses Lake, my grandma would have us over after church every Sunday, and no matter where we were, um, we would come together at a specific time, and grandma would put the food in the oven, and she would leave to church then, and we'd all go to church. And I just thought of this last service. When I said that out loud, I realized that is just crazy that grandma would leave her oven on cooking food as we're at church. And it just hit me that that's wild. It's never hit me before, but that's what she would do. And we'd come back for church and, and we, would, we would eat. Um, but one thing that was different about holidays is that that's when grandpa would actually say a prayer before we would eat together. And specifically Thanksgiving, and he'd pray this Thanksgiving prayer. And every year growing up, and it started at a very young age, when grandpa would go to say the prayer to bow your head and close your eyes, that was the moment that I would snag some food at Thanksgiving because people's eyes were closed. Started young with cookies. It was in the kitchen to start out, and I uh, remember at a young age taking the first cookie right before uh, the Thanksgiving meal, and then you get a little bit older, and now you get a little bit more uh, you know, bold. You're around the table and you grab some of the turkey. Put that in there. Am I the only one? I'm getting judged right now by anyone that's making the turkey. Um, sorry. Uh, don't invite me over for Thanksgiving. I still do it. So, and, um, and so one year, I'm 19 years old. I was over here uh, in Renton uh, studying to be a pastor. And so I, I come over. I, I drive over there on Thanksgiving morning. And again, grandpa's around. The circle's there. The food, it looks amazing. Absolutely incredible. I am more mature now. And so I don't go. No, I do. I wait till the eyes are closed, the head's bowed. And in that moment, I look over at the rolls. And those were some good looking rolls. And I know that in three minutes of having to wait a little extra time, they'll go cold. You gotta eat them when they're warm. So, <laughs> heads bowed, eyes closed, I reach for that roll, I go and I shove that thing all the way in my mouth because I only have a certain amount of time. Grandpa's prayers are not super long, just enough long that you can eat a whole roll if you shove it in your mouth real quick. So he goes, he says, okay, bow your head and close your eyes and uh, we do that and right away, boom, go up because I put it in and I, and I shove it in there and then all of a sudden I'm chomping on it and it's silent. I'm like, okay, let's go, Grandpa, but actually, this is good. I got some time. And I, he goes, you know what? Let's have Matt say the prayer <laughs> this year. In 19, you know, you're a man. Now you're going and studying to be a pastor. This would be incredible. I mean, what an honor. Not in that moment, not an honor, because I had, had already put that bread inside my mouth, and now I'm supposed to be mature and all this stuff and going to school to be a pastor, and so going like that, and I look up, and everyone's staring at me, and so I nod. <laughs> now I'm figuring out, okay, what am I going to do? I can't take it out of my mouth now, because Joel, my cousin, always is watching during prayer. He'll point it out, he'll look, so I'm sitting there, and I look over, and sure enough, Joel's going like this, looking around. It's quiet, and what seems like forever, because it's a prayer, and 10 seconds seems like two minutes of complete silence. I then try to get it down, it gets lodged into my throat, I get the whole thing down, but it's still there. You know that feeling where just a little bit of that dry cracker is stuck in your throat? This is bread though, and it's a full on bread thing, and there's a lump there, and so then I choke up, which kind of made it great because everyone thought I was crying. I was like, Oof. <laughs> Such a privilege. I finally get that down with just a little bit of a voice just to say, thank you for the meal, amen. And I literally got through it and I had swallowed that and it was incredible that I actually made it through that when no one actually knew that I had actually had that full bread in my mouth. And I look back at that moment and as I look back, it was more than the food. Because for me at that age, it was all about the food. And as I look back and my grandpa's gone, I think about what powerful moments took place around that table on Sundays and around these moments that we had food together as fellow believers that I took for granted. It was so much more than the food. 
And as believers today, I want you to know as traditionally we've uh, received communion in some churches monthly, some uh, uh, weekly. What I want you to know is God, I want to recapture for us today that have just looked at these elements as a come and a go out of a church building. I want us to recapture the beauty of sharing a meal around a table. Yes, you came to church today to hear this, that I want you to recapture something inside of your soul and spirit, that God wants us to recapture the power, the beauty of sharing meals around a table with one another. It's been a challenging couple years. And whatever side you're on or what you think and all those things, we can say that it has been interrupted, our meals around the table, not just at restaurants, but where we would sit together with friends, with families, other believers coming together and to partake in a meal. You know, most of the greatest moments in Christianity were built around the table. We're built around a table, around food. Some of the greatest moments, the first miracle at a party where there's food and ran out of drink, and so Jesus says, hey, I got this. Let's make this happen. Water into wine. A miracle took place. Jesus' first miracle was around food. You have the feeding of 5,000. Christianity built around food. Feeding of 5,000, Jesus would come to share and talk, but he knew the t- stomachs were, were, were empty, and so he did this miracle to feed 5,000 people with just some bread and some, some fish. After the resurrection, this is crazy, Jesus had literally died on the cross, he rose again the third day, God in flesh, coming back before he ascends to heaven, and you know what he says, he gets over to the boat, he says, hey guys, catch something, let's, uh, actually, let's have some breakfast. The first thing that Jesus did after he ascended to heaven, he's like, hey guys, let's, I'm, I'm hungry. Let's have some breakfast. One of the most popular meals that we look at is the Last Supper. That before Jesus did go on that cross, that he was a, around a table with his disciples. And in 1 Corinthians 11, as we open up to that today, Paul the Apostle doesn't say he uses this term, the Lord's Supper, that it's not, he, it is the Last Supper, but he uses it different. He says now it's called the Lord's Supper. He, that's what he names it. I think Paul just had that perspective in that moment that just knew that, hey, this isn't the Last Supper. Come on, we, he had another supper after that, and he's gonna have another one after that. It's the Lord's Supper. In church tradition, we call it communion. And other times in the book of Luke and Acts, it's, it's the breaking of bread, that people would meet in homes together, breaking bread, not just to eat. It was more than the food. It was believers coming together around food with union and celebrating Jesus, God, and with union with his people. I love this. It's said in scripture that agape feast is a term that's used. Agape feast feast, the love feast, not the love fest, I just want to be clear on that, because someone, don't get that, two completely different things, completely different things, that just came into my mind, I, you had it there, it's different, the agape feast, the, the love feast, it was God's people coming together because of God's love and the love they experienced to come together in unity, different backgrounds, different nations, different tribes, different tongues. But under Jesus, you come together, the agape feast, the love feast. Today I want you to know, I don't know where you're at with your relationship with Jesus, I don't know if you've began one with him, but Jesus is inviting you to sit at his table. This is what Paul the Apostle in the chapter that we're gonna read today, I'm just gonna give it to you right now. Paul is talking to the church and he's saying, look, everyone is invited to sit at the table of Jesus. Put away the disagreements. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, where we pick up Paul says this, he says, listen, for I have received from the Lord, this is what I've received, it's been passed down, call it what you want, communion, the breaking of bread, but what I've received from the Lord, I also pass on to you. Says the Lord Jesus, we've heard it before, if you're not new to Bible study or or to church, we sit in monthly gathering out of each month and sit with the elements of the the bread and and the juice. It says, this is what happened, though, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. Let's just be reminded about the story 
about what Jesus did before he went to that cross, before he died that death, before he was the sacrifice that he set around a table with humanity, with his disciples. He sat around the table with Judas, the man that would that night literally betray Jesus, that Judas would literally exchange food and the money that would buy food because it wasn't more to him. No, I'd rather have the money. We know the story on how that ends. He gives up the relationship with God and even the people that were around that table. Ends his life. I'm reminded about Psalms. That the Lord prepares a table for you and for me in the presence of my enemies. When Jesus was sitting around that table, he was in the presence of what someone would call an enemy. Let me tell you something today, we can sit around the table of Jesus that he invites us to, but it has to be more than food to us today. It has to be more than a tradition. It has to be more than just a once a month to make me feel better, just to remember in a moment. He said that he was betrayed. Some of us feel like we've betrayed Jesus. Let me tell you something, you are still invited to the table. Today is a new day. Mercies are new every single morning. And when Jesus had, had given thanks, he's giving thanks, he broke it, he broke that bread, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He takes that bread and And he breaks it and he says, this is a sign, this is an element to show you what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be going to the cross. My body is going to be torn. It's going to be ripped. It's going to be pierced for your sins. He says this, while we know that, I want you to continue to do this even after the fact. So this isn't just a one moment thing to look back and remember what Jesus did in that powerful story. He actually says, I want you to continue to do this. Now what is this? Do this, what is is this? You know what this is? This is a body of believers coming together in community to celebrate, come on, the grace of Jesus together. That he is the Lord. Do not give up doing this. Don't give up. Believers, to coming together outside of a program on a Sunday morning, sure we need it, but this is the time to celebrate what God is already doing in our life because we've gone out there and we have said, listen, we're gonna continue to do this. We are the church. Let's continue to come together. Let's show a divided world what it means that you may have a different story, a different outtake on certain things. You may even have disagreements, but we're all under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We need some people to continue to do this, to invite some people over for dinner. We need to come together and celebrate what Jesus has has done for us. When you do this, man, the world needs to see this again. I think revival would just, would just happen. It won't be at an altar. That's where it begins many times, but I think that we're just gonna see revival when neighbors start, oh, oh, that's cool, you go to that church? Oh, that's, that's all right, come over to my house for dinner. Let's come together, let's share this feast that we are all bought with the blood of Jesus. Do this and do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, they have the, the bread, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Man, I'm thankful for the new covenant of Jesus Christ. You know what the new covenant is, is that not only is God sitting at the head of the table, not only is God on the throne, not only has God asked you to sit at his table, but God serves that table. Jesus in flesh was not only God sitting at the end of the table, at the head of the table, he's not only there to invite creation, that would be enough that we could even sit at the table. He's saying this is a new covenant, I'm actually here to serve you at the table. It's unheard of. 
It's unheard of that the person that would be sitting at the head of the table, even the people that are invited to the meal, unheard of that we would serve. They're servants for that. But when Jesus came, it was the new covenant that it wasn't by our works. He came down, he was the servant so that we could be bought with the price. That bread is not just bread. It's an illustration that his body was broken so that we'd be the children of God. The juice is not just the juice, it is the blood that was shed, the new covenant that we celebrate, not in condemnation or with guilt or with shame, but we come in in celebration because we have the joy of our salvation. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembrance, what does that word really mean? as we receive communion together today. I've heard it a lot, to remember. We have many great memories, don't we? Many, many memories that we look back at and just think, those are incredible. But this word memory and remembrance here, remembrance is not just a memory. The remembrance word here actually means an awareness. It's not just a memory or an awareness of what Jesus did in the past, it's an awareness of what he wants to do right now in the presence. It's an awareness when we remember, when we break the bread and the juice together and we go through that tradition together, the sacraments together, it is an awareness of God, I'm not just celebrating what you did, but I'm celebrating what you're doing now. Right now. When I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God, he came into my body, and that is now, not later, but God, what are you doing now? Oh, I love it. It's not just past, and it's not just present, but God, we are gonna remember and our hope in the future. When we look back at what Jesus did in the past, and we ask him to continue to move in us and through us in the present, we are able to look to the future and remember what that he did there is so that we can spend heaven and eternity with God in the future. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm receiving communion, that's what I like to remember. I like the awareness to know no matter how hard life is right now for you and no matter what's going on in our culture or what's happening, that we can still remember. Don't neglect remembering. Remember that Jesus, what he did here, impacts the future there. You know, Revelations 19, it's interesting. When the writer talks about heaven and when Jesus returns, you know when he's talking about Jesus returning is literally a picture of the bridegroom at a feast around a table. Jesus again with his humanity and his disciples, not just past, but we are aware not only in the presence, but God one day we will sit at your table, not just spiritually, but physically in heaven with God, celebrating not just with him, but his people should change the way we live, should change the way we receive communion today, should change the way we view communion, that it's not just in a church service, but we are the church to commune together, unity. As we close today, 1 Corinthians verse 26, Paul says this, for whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Past, present, future. Let's continue until he returns, until we sit at his table, continue to remember what Jesus did. And everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. When Paul writes this, it's really, it's a neglected thing we miss so often is So often, maybe at times in my relationship with Jesus, I've come to church to get better, to feel better, to because something's going on wrong or this is happening and I just need church in this moment. But what Paul the Apostle is saying, when we receive communion, we should have already examined our lives. We not only examine our lives in a sacrament moment, but every day, Monday through Sunday, is there anybody here that just says, I thank God that he reminds me that I gotta continue to examine my life. I'm not examining your life right now. I'm not examining that person's. I don't know why they reacted the way they did. I'm examining my life. How can I respond here? Because the the communion is not just past, it's presence, God. It's present. May we be a people that could be present at a dinner table because we've examined our lives before we've sat down. 
fathers, mothers, people that lead your homes, what would it look like for a moment we don't just use a pastor once a month to walk us through a communion service? What if we just sat down with our family, go once a month, and you just ate food together, and you prayed a prayer of thanksgiving for what Jesus did on the cross? It's not all complicated. We don't have to get all worked up. That Now I need all the scriptures. No, 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 guys. I'm just thankful that Jesus rose from the dead, that we can celebrate with food, that he provided for us salvation and for this food and our community together. What would it look like if a church was doing that during the week and stepped into a Sunday already ready to go? When we receive communion, it's celebration. It's not condemnation. God, that we would examine ourselves before the table. So we're gonna do that today. We're gonna examine ourselves before communion, but here it is, communion, it's God's people celebrating Jesus around a meal. That's what it is. So what are we gonna do about that? Whose friends do we need to call back that we haven't talked to for maybe a little while here? And we know that they're Christians, we know there's been some hard times, but we need to come together and have some food. What would it look like if we now had to examine ourselves as the heads of homes with our kids before we sat at a table once a week? Because we needed to examine ourselves before we sat at this table so we could actually have a great meal together and there's not this weird stuff going on that no one's talking about or communicating. It starts with communion to examine ourselves as we remember what Jesus did on the cross. So with every head bowed and eyes closed today, we're gonna receive communion together. And in this moment, we've talked about the body of Jesus, and we've talked about the blood and what it means. And so today, you know what that means, but for you, maybe right now, you're in here, and you have never given your life to Jesus. You have never said, Jesus, you're at the head of the table. Jesus, you're at the head of the table. My life, I'm here sitting You're the one leading, you're the one guiding, you're the Lord of my life. I want you to be able to take in a holy communion today. I want you to be able to receive it with the body of Christ. And today, that's the first step. Welcome to the family. If you're in here right now, I just want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to raise your hand right here. I wanna pray a prayer over you that you wanna accept Jesus to receive communion with power today, not just some sacrament that you do. Anybody here in the back? Anybody else? Anybody else? It's great. In a few moments, I just can't help but believe there's some people in here, you didn't take communion, you didn't like grab it and pick it up because of that, because you just said, I'm not right with God. And in this moment, you've just accepted Jesus. You say, Jesus, you could say, be the Lord of my life. You're at the head of the table. I give you my mind, I give you my heart, I give you my life. For some of us in here, it's do this. You're in here, you say, you know what, I've just gone through life here recently, it's been chaotic, it's been crazy, and you've gone through just a routine with family, with work, and you haven't stopped a moment, you haven't done what Paul talks about, what Jesus commanded, as often as you have a meal, do this, and today you say, you know what, I need to be reminded that communion is not just in a church building, but it's within the church community and believers. You say, I just wanna, I don't know what this means, but you're gonna have a, this week you're gonna decide maybe to schedule something once a week, once a month with food around friends. I want you to raise your hand, just say, I'm gonna respond to this message that way. I wanna pray over you in a moment. Yeah, anybody else? You say, you know, I need to talk to a neighbor. <laughs> there's somebody, yeah, I see it. You say, man, I've been, there's been this frustration and division with a believer, a fellow believer. You just say, yeah, I need to do this. I need to stop, I need to share a meal, we need to make it about Jesus. Come on, you're in here and you just need to remember. There's a remembrance that needs to take place. Traditionally, you've always remembered from the past, but no, 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 you need to remember for today. What do you need to do this week? What what are you thankful that Jesus did on that cross? And then you need to examine. Some of us, we just, man, you just need to examine. It's been a while since you just sat down and examined your life. Today, if that's you, just raise your hand and go, you know what, I'm just gonna take a moment. It's been busy, it's been crazy. I just haven't taken this. You're gonna commit to examining regularly, not just on a Sunday. Yeah, anybody else, it's awesome. 
So Lord, before we receive these elements, I pray over those who raise their hand to give their life to you. I thank you, God, as they confess their sin to you. You are faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. We are the family of God now, partaking in communion together. Lord, I pray this wouldn't be where it stops, though, for those who just gave their life to you, that it wouldn't stop at a little cup and a little tiny cracker, God, but it would continue in other community with believers. You'd place people in their lives to disciple, to come together and eat together. Lord, I pray over those who need to do this, need to come together, not for the food, but they would celebrate around food of what you did for them, their families, their kids. I even sense there's someone here, Lord, God, that's been struggling with their kids. As simple as the message is today, here is your freedom. Sit down, have a meal with your kids. Thank you, Jesus. It's gonna be difficult. It's gonna be hard. It's been a while. I know it's easy for me to say I don't know that story. But man, if you'd examine yourself right now and you'd give that to God, you're gonna get grace from your kids. It may take some time. It may take a while. Lord, I pray for those couple individuals right now, Jesus. Holy Spirit, touch them, Lord. Give them the boldness they need. Lord, give them the grace they need when the response isn't what they wanna hear, God. Give them the consistence and the perseverance to continue with love, to re-bridge that relationship. We love you, God. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name, let's receive the bread together. Lord, right now, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. Lord, we thank you, God, that it was your blood as we go to take this, receive it, Lord, and drink this. We thank you for the blood that was shed, the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, that we remember every time we eat, something had to die for that meal. No matter what we're eating, something had to die for that meal. Lord, I pray we would remember as we receive this juice that you had to die for us to share a meal with you. God, remind us throughout the week that we take moments around food, God, to remember that you, somebody had to die so that we could celebrate, so that we could feast. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. We don't now come under condemnation, but with great joy, the joy of our salvation. We give you our lives, we give you our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's receive the cup together. And now in this moment, Let's celebrate with worship. Let's stand everyone together and let's begin to sing out all that God is doing and continue to do in our lives. Let's do that.